Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Bonjour, bienvenue. Good morning. Huye more, molo, dumela, how's it? Bonjour. My name is Elsie Kanza, and I'm the Director Head of Africa and a proud young global leader. <laughs> and it is a great honor and privilege for me and my team of colleagues at the Forum to be your hosts at this meeting. Allow me to begin by thanking you for taking time from your busy schedules to join this annual gathering of our broader African community and friends of Africa. I'd also like to thank the city of Cape Town, government of South Africa, and people of South Africa for their warm welcome and outstanding collaboration that has made this year's meeting possible. We're also grateful to our co-chairs, Franz van Houten, Chief Executive Officer and Chairman, Royal Philips Electronics Netherlands, Mo Ibrahim, Chairman, Mo Ibrahim Foundation, United Kingdom, Mustafa Koch, Chairman of the Board, Koch Holding, Turkey, Franny Lottier, Executive Secretary, African Capacity Building Foundation, and also a Chair of a Global Agenda Council on Youth Employment, and Arif Nakvi, Founder and Group Chief Executive, the Abraj Group from the United Arab Emirates. Thank you. As well as our 43 official partners for their dedicated support. Last week, as I was transiting through Frankfurt from our head office to come here for this meeting, an Eritrean lady approached me and said, excuse me for asking, are you Somalian? Now, I'm accustomed to being mistaken for South African based on my looks at home, here, inside and outside of Africa, or Kenyan based on my accent, or from the Democratic Republic of Congo based on my surname. Somalian was a first. She went on to explain that last year, when the late Prime Minister of Ethiopia passed away, she was searching for information on him and came across a website, the World Economic Forum, and she could swear that she saw someone exactly like me speaking Somali. So I laughed and confirmed that it was indeed me, and the language was Kiswahili, and it was basically a call traditionally issued before telling a riddle or a story. In honor of that lady and in memory of the late Prime Minister Zanawi, I beg your indulgence to repeat the tradition introduced last year when I make the call, Kitenda Wili, you reply, Tega. And what Tega means is, go ahead. Kitenda Wili. Yeah. More energy. Kitenda Wili. Yeah. Excellent. As I mentioned at the welcome reception last evening, we're off to a flying start. This year, we have an unprecedented and unparalleled number of participants attending across all stakeholder groups, which I believe is a recognition not only of the high levels of interest this region is attracting across the globe, but also the growing credibility and sophistication of the region's own businesses, civil society groups, and political leaders. Let me share some numbers. Over 1,000 participants from over 80 countries globally. Of the 50 over 50% of these participants come from across Africa from 41 countries. A total of 12 current heads of state or government from Benin, Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, Mauritius, Nigeria, South Africa, of course, Swaziland, Tanzania, Togo, Uganda, and Zimbabwe, as well as three former heads of state or government from Cape Verde, Mozambique, and the United Kingdom. We are truly Pan-African. Women participation is up to 22%, and this year, one-third of all speaking roles will feature women. It's another big feat. We're not fully there, but we're on our way. We also have unprecedented attendance by young global leaders, global shapers, social entrepreneurs, civil society leaders or NGO leaders, labor union leaders, academic leaders, media leaders, religious leaders, and cultural, cultural leaders, reflecting our multi-stakeholder spirit. As you are aware, the forum is about more than bringing people together. It's also about creating a platform for all our stakeholders' communities to collectively discuss and agree on how to work together to make Africa a better place for all. This year's theme, Delivering on Africa's Promise, is essentially a call for action, focused on three key priorities. One, accelerating economic diversification. According to the World Bank, 
African countries still incur a food import bill of $25 billion annually, of which only $1 billion is traded within African countries. This needs to change. Two, boosting strategic infrastructure. Only 12% of Africa's trade is within Africa. This compares to 60% in the European Union and 40% in Asia. This too needs to change. Three, unlocking Africa's talent. By 2015, Africa will be the youngest continent in the world, and by 2040, Africa will have the la a larger workforce than China. What an opportunity. With such an August gathering, we're confident that you will be able to meet the expectations of Africa's citizens. The journey has begun, and yesterday, many of you participated in sessions where you took stock of progress made over the past year with respect to ongoing initiatives, such as the Grow Africa Partnership Initiative related to agriculture, the Africa Strategic Infrastructure Initiative, the Water Resource Groups Initiative that has been very successful in South Africa and is now spreading to East and West Africa, and the Green Growth Action Alliance. A final note is that given how Pan-African we have become, we have increased the integration of French this year and introduced Portuguese interpretation for some sessions. All plenary and TV debate sessions will be live streamed to the world at large in both English and French. Without further delay, let me now introduce our eminent panelists for our opening plenary entitled Building with Bricks. I begin with the far end with uh, Donald Kaberuka, President of the African Development Bank and Chair of the Global Agenda Council on Africa. Naveen Jindal, Chairman, Jindal Steel and Power in, Cam in India, also a young global leader alumnus. Madame Nkosazana Clarice Dlamini Zuma, Chairperson, first female Chairperson of the African Union Commission from Addis Ababa. David Lipton, first Deputy Managing Director from the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. And our main host, His Excellency Jacob Zuma, President of South Africa. <laughs> this session will be chaired by Professor Klaus Schwab, Founder and Executive Chairman of the World Economic Forum. Over to you, Professor Schwab. Thank you very much, Elsie Kanza, and thank you for being such a great ambassador, I should say, not only inside the Forum for Africa, but uh, around the world. For me, personally, this meeting is a very special one. It is the 23rd uh, World Economic Forum on Africa, and actually the first two had taken place in Geneva, and it's exactly, Mr. President, it's exactly 20 years ago that the World Economic Forum held its first meeting on African soil here in Cape Town and practically at the same time in May. And if I look back, I have to say how much Africa has changed. The attitudes, the spirit, and of course uh, today as we heard so many times, Africa is a continent of promise. But we should not forget that if you take the GDP participations, participation of Africa on global GDP, today it's 3%. Now, if you take the population of Africa and you relate it to the world population, it should be around 15%. It shows the gap, but it shows also the promise. And here, uh, we, during this meeting, we want to highlight the opportunities which Africa is offering. And today, we are starting with this plenary session, uh, which is mainly devoted to uh, the BRICS and uh, Mr. President, uh, you are not only a member of uh, the G20, but you have been a member, you are now a member of the BRICS countries, and you have been the host of a very important BRICS summit recently in Durban. But before you take the floor, I would like to thank you personally, because 
uh, having been now, uh, having established a partnership with uh, your country uh, expressed in your great um, hosting uh, this event, uh, your government, the population of South Africa. Uh, we are very grateful for this, um, I would say, friendship which has been established between your country and the World Economic Forum. But coming back to my question, um, Your Excellency, what is the impact of you belonging to the BRICS uh, on Africa, on your country, and of course, on Africa at large? Well, thank you. Thank you very much <clears throat> indeed, uh, Professor. Uh, thank you for uh, coming once again to South Africa, to Cape Town, and uh, really welcome my colleagues and everyone who's here. <clears throat> it's such a wonderful uh, warm spirit that we feel and vibrancy. <clears throat> uh, as you say, uh, Africa is changing. The very fact that uh, we had the BRICS summit, I think it indicates the kind of change. Uh, I believe that uh, the membership of South Africa to BRICS <coughs> represents, I think, a very important turning point to Africa's economic activities and connectivity to the globe. You, you, you are all aware that uh, many major events in the centuries have bypassed Africa. Africa seemed not to be existing when the world was active in many ways. This time around, I think, the, the BRICS <coughs> link indicates that Africa cannot be bypassed by the events that are changing the landscape economically and politically and socially of the world. The fact that we have one of the African countries being a member of BRICS <clears throat> in the name of South Africa. Our belief, and it's not just the belief of South Africa only, I think all countries, is that the membership of South Africa to BRICS represents the one billion people in the continent of Africa. That, I think, was <clears throat> um, clearly demonstrated by what happened in the summit here. We have had summits in the BRICS ever since we are members of BRICS, but when we came to South Africa, a good number of African heads of states came to participate <clears throat> along the BRICS summit to discuss, I think, uh, for the first time, that emerging economies, very huge economies, as a collective of BRICS, had a moment to interact with the African heads of states, those in particular who lead the economic regions of the continent, as well as those who lead NAPAT and the other leaders, to discuss what Africa today is discussing in terms of the need for integration of the economic regions and activities in the continent, as well as <clears throat> the infrastructure to help present a good platform for intra-trade in the continent. Africa says time has come to change. And of course, as you know, if we talk about <clears throat> the integration of the economy, if we talk about the infrastructure, which is championed by a number of heads of states, it indicates that Africa's attitude towards itself and towards how it should interact with the world has changed. Of course, as you know, one of the major problems would be how do you finance the infrastructure? so that we are able to move forward. That <clears throat> uh, summit helped to create that interaction between the representative of the leadership of the continent 
and BRICS. In other words, Africa could today, unlike in the past, we could say in the past, come, invest in Africa, there are possibilities. But it would not be easy to, to, to really look at them and say, here are these possibilities. I think BRICS leadership found it very pleasing that Africa could say, here are specific projects that Africa is presenting to investors. And I think <clears throat> that meeting was very, was very, very useful. Firstly, the unified voice of the African leaders on the issues that need to be prioritized, but also for those who have the, the means to be able to look at <clears throat> the case presented by Africa and say, we are ready to respond. It was an important one, and I think <clears throat> Uh, taking it from BRICS even to this World Economic Forum, I think Africa has a story to tell, has a presentation to make. This, I think, says Africa has changed. But it also says a lot to the South, to the developing countries, that this grouping, um, <clears throat> BRICS, is, rep is presenting an organized voice within the broader <clears throat> uh, section of the South, that we are in a better position to present this. And it also, the, 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 the interaction between Africa and BRICS, it brings an organized interaction so that the relationship is not haphazard, is not all over, is well organized, so that whatever we are able to benefit, benefits all of us in the continent of Africa. I think it represents a different level of Africa's development, particularly if you take into account that Africa is one of the regions that is fast developing economically. And therefore, I think African leaders are saying, for the first time, let us organize ourselves, let us talk to uh, the kind of organizations that will respond very positively and very effectively to what we think needs to be done in our continent. So we are very happy that uh, we're able to organize that kind of interaction of BRICS and the leaders in the continent of Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I think it's very important what, what you just uh, told us. Uh, BRICS is not just a accumulation of five important countries. It is a symbolic and real expression of the great transformation taking place in the world with the transfer of economic and political power from the north to the south and from the west to the east. Now, David Lipton, you are the deputy managing director of the IMF. How do you react to what you just heard from uh, the president and how in the framework of uh, the global outlook of the IMF, how do you see the BRICS and particularly also Africa? Thank you. First, let me, uh, Klaus, thank you for inviting me here. And President Zuma, thank you so much for the hospitality uh, South Africa has shown. Um, I think that uh, <coughs> the role of the BRICS uh, can be uh, very much uh, a new factor and an important positive factor here. First, on the economies of uh, the region, uh, the economies of sub-Saharan Africa have been generating growth now, strong growth, for over 15 years. And uh, this is a, a coming together of uh, a set of uh, events, the end of the ideological strife in Africa, the clear political direction on economic issues to promote stability and promote uh, growth, the uh, experienced generation of policymakers who are doing such a good job. And the new factor, uh, information technology, computers, uh, phones that are allowing Africa to span distances. Remoteness, after all, has been one of the most difficult uh, uh, broad problems for Africa. Uh, Africa now faces, uh, it's interesting that Africa's progress was not derailed by uh, this financial crisis. Uh, we've written a paper uh, I'll give an advertisement for Chapter 4 of our World Economic Outlook that just came out, looking at the question, is this a false dawn? Is 
African growth going to stall? And our conclusion after looking at this quite seriously is that this growth is robust and we expect it uh, to continue. Africa also obviously has a huge amount of remaining challenges and that I think is where the BRICS come in. Uh, Africa of course has relied very heavily on advanced economy markets and now advanced economy markets are stalled and not providing the kind of engine that they have in the past. Uh, and so the role for BRICS and not just BRICS but other uh, middle income countries I think is substantial. Let's approach it for a second by asking what do countries need that the BRICS could provide? They need macroeconomic stability, strong financial systems, trade, and investment. And I think BRIC countries can contribute in a range of areas. Let me use as an illustration, I was in Mozambique before coming to South Africa, and to me the Mozambican situation and story tells the picture. First, Mozambique has discovered huge natural resources. They need companies to help them extract those resources. Already there's a big Brazilian company involved and other uh, uh, BRIC companies can become involved. They then need to turn all of those resources into productive assets. They need to build infrastructure. They are in the process of uh, being, they're already a port for South Africa, but those facilities need to be upgraded. They can become uh, a, a, a port for landlocked countries to the west, but that will require infrastructure. They have 78% of the population uh, still in agriculture, many living in remote areas that need agricultural access roads. BRIC countries can help with the infrastructure. They need to em enhance agricultural productivity. Who knows about enhancing agricultural productivity? Uh, Brazil, India. Um, and along the way, they need to build the capacity to be able to do those things well. And BRIC countries have gone through <coughs> dealing with those challenges. So I think there's a lot of uh, room for help in terms of technical assistance, capacity building, and uh, so on. This will be hard. Mozambique's also an example of how difficult the challenge is with uh, remote, uh, with substantial income disparity, very poor people living in remote areas, lack of, so poverty, lack of, a, of, of skills, the need for an education system. Uh, the challenges will be uh, very great. Uh, I think BRIC com uh, countries, their companies, their governments, uh, can play a very important role, as can uh, other middle-income countries, helping African countries develop, helping them integrate uh, so that eventually uh, they can uh, help each other. And as Klaus started out by saying, in essence, helping uh, Sub-Saharan Africa get on the convergence path uh, with, with uh, income levels that rise and start heading towards uh, uh, the levels that are experienced in more developed countries. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, Dr. Kaberuka, uh, so President, uh, President Suma mentioned already infrastructure, the significance of infrastructure. Um, David Lipton uh, referred to his experience in Mozambique. Uh, you are at the core in financing also infrastructure, and it plays a big role, uh, infrastructure, inside our program uh, those <coughs> days. Could you comment on, on how infrastructure development in, in, in um, Africa could be accelerated <coughs> and particularly the role of BRICS also in this respect? Uh, thank you, Klaus. Um, but could I just uh, add a small point to what uh, President Zuma said? I think our relationship with the BRICS is about all those things. But I think one of the most fundamental one is the experience of development. Some of these countries were poor not long ago, and they have come to where they are by a combination of policies and uh, some choice in investment. <coughs> I think that is important for Africa as well, because for a long time we have struggled with how does development happen, and we thought there was a model out there which can be imported. Now we know that development happens in many different ways. So if you look at this G20, all the countries on the table have reached development from different angles, some from uh, less fair capitalism, others welfare capitalism, others by state capitalism, others by muddling through. I think all those experiences are very important for us as well. 
Now coming to your question in close, I think uh, this is our take. <coughs> this is a very exciting moment in Africa. There are many problems around inequalities, inclusion, that kind of uh, issues we have to deal with. Uh, however, the fact is, if you take many regions of Africa, ECOWAS, for example, because I can see President Nigeria is here, the GDP of ECOWAS has multiplied five times in the last 20 years. If you look at the per capita uh, income in Africa now, I know that's an average, well, for the first time, crossed the $1,000 per person barrier. That is significant. That is significant. Now, there are issues around inclusion, inequalities, as I say. We have to come to that. Now, there are some risks to this uh, momentum in Africa. As I was saying yesterday in another panel, I think the first risk is uh, politics. We have to fix our politics, uh, ensure that uh, combat for politics occurs in a manner which uh, keeps development going. Number two is the global economy, because we're not an island. Number three is infrastructure. In other words, reducing the costs of doing business. Because poor infrastructure adds about 40% to the cost of doing business on the continent and trading. So we have come to a point where now a lot of progress has been made, but now we have to come to, to scale. Every country you visit, there are issues of power, of connectivity, of transport. Now, how do we bring this to scale? The first thing is to look at ourselves. It can't just be the BRICS. We, in our own countries, by better mobilization of resources, our savings in our countries, in our regions, across the continent. That is why, that is why the African Development Bank, in its new 10-year strategy, which we discussed with uh, Dr. Zuma here and Addis not long ago in the context of this 50th anniversary, we are trying to, run, to launch a special vehicle, a special initiative for Africa itself to mobilize our own resources for infrastructure. Because we are sitting on resources on this continent, and I think that is a place to begin. Because we can no longer depend on, on foreign aid for this kind of thing. Having done that, we are now to look for partnership with other countries. Now, that partnership is not only for the BRICS. It has to be with other countries as well, but mainly the BRICS. And I think here, uh, at I think the G20 <coughs> summit in Korea, I think President Zuma, if you recall, the Prime Minister of India gave a very good idea. He said, look, among some of the BRICS countries, you have got a huge surpluses, which are destabilizing currencies as well in the world. Why don't we figure out how to recycle some of those surpluses in high return African infrastructure? Not as grants or as gifts, but we identify projects on the African continent within PIDA, which are high return, and we figure out a mechanism to get those surpluses into this infrastructure. Then a high level panel was set in, put in place, chaired by Tiam, under the French G20 presidency, but we have not gone far. I think we have to pick this again. And I think the creation of this bank, which was discussed in Durban, was a very good thing as a vehicle. I think we could work together with other African institutions, in particular the African Development Bank, to intermediate uh, those resources and uh, increase investment in infrastructure. Now, I was a bit disappointed though, uh, President Zuma, that the BRIC Bank, I think I was hoping for a much more ambitious uh, instrument. I think I had figures of 50 billion, that is too small, because the African Development Bank itself, our size is 100 billion dollar uh, capital. And I'm hoping the BRICS Bank can be more ambitious, maybe five times our size. But surely they cannot come in with 50 billion. It'd be too small, too small. But assuming that the BRICS Bank is an ambitious vehicle, which I hope it is, I know you are pushing that very much. I think there is opportunity here for us to cooperate, not as grants, not as gifts, but to invest in infrastructure on the continent, which will then increase trade opportunities for ourselves, but also trade opportunities between us and the BRICS. I would like to go back immediately to President Zuma and ask him, um, this concept of the BRICS Development Bank is such an important concept. What will you and can you do to make sure that this bank becomes soon a reality? Well, thank you once again. 
Uh, <clears throat> the bank is going to be soon a reality. As, as you know, the BRICS summit in Durban took a very firm decision to establish the bank. Uh, and finance ministers have been instructed to work on the details of it. <clears throat> there are important issues that need to be considered uh, because we certainly, part of the reason <clears throat> we thought it was important to establish the bank <clears throat> is because we needed a bank that could respond to the challenges and the needs of the developing world, not just BRICS only. Uh, the bank is about the developing countries mm -hmm. <clears throat> that the BRICS is establishing. So the decision has been taken. I think there are just two issues, besides other uh, details that would be worked on. <clears throat> the issue of how do we capacitate, in other words, how do we capitalize the bank by the, the members of BRICS? That is an issue that the <clears throat> finance ministers are discussing, because we want to capacitate it so that it is able to address the immediate needs that the developing countries have. With a different approach to the world-established old banks, uh, which at times, if you wanted uh, to deal with your matters as quickly as possible, the bureaucracy is rather a little bit <coughs> slow for those who are in need. That's one of the issues that, we, that they are looking at. Mm -hmm. How do we capitalize it? Because we don't want just a bank that would not be able to respond to the huge challenges. Secondly, <clears throat> is domicile, where will it be? And Africa is very interested that the bank must be in Africa. Every other thing is outside this African continent. And Africa feels uh, we need this bank to be established here, particularly because the greater need of the bank certainly is in the continent of Africa. In the next summit, <clears throat> I'm sure, we'll be, we'll be getting a, a report about the two issues that I've raised and other issues. Mm -hmm. And then there will be a very clear decision because the BRICS members understand the need, the urgent need of the bank to be operational as quickly as possible. So it will be, um, I'm sure, in the next, which will be held, uh, I think, in Brazil, yeah. <clears throat> there will be a report that says, what do we do? Because the decision has been taken. It's a question of how do we capacitate it, mm -hmm. where will it be located, and what are other kind of things that go with the, what, what the bank should do. David, just a short word. Uh, you are representing one of the traditional Bretton Woods organizations, and of course the World Bank is one of the three organizations, and you are one. Uh, do you see it as a complementary move or as a competition? Oh, I, th I think it's a complementary move. We surely see the need for mobilizing infrastructure investment. We've uh, studied that uh, at the request of uh, the G20, in which the BRICS all participate, and identified the need. And uh, I, I think it's complementary and could, will be complementary to the fine work of the African Development Bank as well. Yeah. Let's, let's come to the role uh, of uh, private business, also in infrastructure development. And uh, you, um, Navin Chinda, uh, you are a member of the Indian Parliament, representing two million constituents, but you are also a well-known business leader and one of our young global leaders. How do you see how you could contribute to um, the infrastructural development, not only in your country, which is very much in need of better infrastructure, but of Africa. Thank you, Mr. Schwab, for uh, inviting me here. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, President Zuma for his <coughs> hospitality, and also for providing uh, leadership in promoting cooperation between Africa and BRICS. So the question, uh, we see lots and lots of opportunities in Africa, in the whole of uh, Africa. And all these are all the areas where the BRICS countries also uh, have lots of uh, challenges and have also learned a lot 
from their experiences of the last uh, few decades. So obviously, we've all been speaking about uh, challenges of infrastructure here. But those very challenges also are opportunities in uh, development of infrastructure. May that be building of roads, railways, ports. Uh, this Africa is blessed with uh, so much of natural resources. But the point is, how do we exploit it for development of Africa? And this is a window of opportunity. These minerals are valuable today. They may not be valuable after 50 years or 100 years. So we have, one has to be able to use these natural resources for the development of this great continent. And then uh, opportunities, whether it's uh, agriculture, whether it is education, health. So learning from the experiences of BRICS countries, I think those very experiences can be very well suited to Africa. So we are looking at many such uh, opportunities here. Most of the African countries that we have seen are uh, having acute shortage of power. And they are running mostly on uh, diesel generating sets, heavy furnace oil, and the cost of power anyway is from 30 to 50 cents. And one could very easily, through various, uh, various ways, whether it's solar or wind, renewable, or even coal-fired, provide power from 10 cents to 15 cents. And I think uh, power is something, is a, is a basic enabler for everything, whether it's education or agriculture or health. One just cannot do without power. So and I think uh, where there's an opportunity, and people are already buying power at very high prices. So I just feel that the time has come that when all these uh, infrastructure projects are going to take off in Africa, and these do provide great opportunities in all the countries, even BRICS countries, and especially in Africa. So I think uh, these are real uh, opportunities here. And, uh, uh, and whoever would, ben whoever, obviously, there are risks also involved. And what needs to be done by these countries is to have uh, model power purchase agreements which are bankable, which are fair to both parties, which are transparent, and in an open uh, bidding environment so that one could get the best prices uh, of power, especially. And I think with power, and already there has been a revolution in uh, mobile telephony all over Africa, and the whole of Africa is benefiting from the mobile uh, revolution, mobile telephone revolution. Similarly, a similar revolution is, needs to take place in uh, infrastructure, especially power generation and transmission. Transmission and connectivity of various regions, various countries with each other, so that surplus power from one country, and it has been happening in local regions, especially in Southern Africa, SEDEC region, it has to happen more all over Africa. And I think this would tremendously uh, help Africa grow, realize its true potential, and also offer opportunities to countries and companies <coughs> investing in these uh, projects. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Suma, you see, African Union, which you chair, just celebrated its 50th anniversary. So congratulations. I think it's also the moment not only to look back and to look at the present uh, issues and challenges, but to look for very much forward, as we all do, of course. But what is your vision for, I, I wouldn't dare to say for the next 50 years, <laughs> but at least for the next 10 years? Can you share with us your longer-term vision of Africa? Uh, thank you very much. Indeed, uh, we are celebrating our, 25th, our 50th anniversary <coughs> starting on the 25th of May this month. And we have decided to celebrate for the whole year, and I'll come to the reason why. Um, and the way we're going to celebrate is to look back just for a moment, to look at our achievements, learn lessons from what we didn't do well, and take care of our present situation and then spend more time looking into the future. And of course, we think that in the next 50 years, Africa should be described as a prosperous continent at peace with itself. 
we think it's achievable. We have look, we are looking at what assets does Africa have that will propel it to this prosperous Africa at peace with itself. And one, I'll mention a few of those assets. Some have been mentioned, but we think our most precious and most abundant asset is our people. We have to invest in our people. We investing in our people means they must be healthy, so investing in health, but also in education and skills, science and technology, research, innovation. If you look at Singapore, for instance, Singapore, maybe 1960 was at the same level as Jamaica uh, in terms of uh, per capita income. But they don't have many natural resources, but they concentrated on skilling their people. And now they are at uh, more than $29,000 per capita. So we have that resource and we have it in abundance and we're going to be growing and it's going to be a young population for a long time, energetic, creative, and innovative. So if we invest in them, we think prosperity is in sight, but agriculture, South Africa is as big as, bigger than, in, in Africa we can fit the United States, we can fit China, we can fit India, we can fit Western Europe, there'll be still, still space for Japan. So we are a huge continent, and that means looking at the world, looking at the available arable land, 60% is, is still available unused in Africa. And that is a huge potential if we invest in agriculture, <coughs> and investing in agriculture will mean not only food for us, but it will also mean food for the world. We will sell food to the world, but we can also create jobs for our people, not only in the immediate agricultural sector, but in the processing of agricultural products. So we can create more jobs and we can export processed food and we can get more revenue from that. The other asset has been mentioned mineral and natural resources. I won't go into it because it has been mentioned. Suffice to say, of course it can also assist us in industrializing. It, it, it has to work for the benefit of our people. Developing infrastructure will also increase our growth, but the absence of infrastructure is a constraint to growth. So infrastructure in transport, why can't we have infrastructure that links all our capitals? That's part of integration. It's possible by rail, by road, and using modern infrastructure. We can't start where the industrial revolution started. There's new technologies. When we talk trains, why can't we speak, talk, speak trains? And I think it's possible. We must set our minds to it. It's possible. And of course, energy. At the moment, we're producing just, we're generating the same amount of energy as Spain in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And Spain, we have 20 times more people than Spain has in Sub-Saharan Africa. And half of that energy is in one country where we are. So there is a huge potential in energy. And of course in telecommunications, it's been mentioned that we are now the second biggest market for mobile telephones, second to Asia. But why can't we use that also for education? Why can't we use internet to have massive programs of education? It's possible, we should do it. And I think looking at the young population and looking at women, if we can get the young people and the women 
in all our human endeavor, then this continent is poised to be amongst the greatest in the world in the next 50 years. And it's possible. It can be done. And of course, we need partnerships. Partners, the way we're going to celebrate, I said, I'll come back to why we're celebrating for the whole year. Our celebration for the whole year is going to our population, to business, to youth, to women, to the artists, to everyone to say, where do you want Africa to be in 50 years? What are the steps that need to be taken? And what is your role that you are going to play in getting there? So our business people should be defining where they want to be, what their role, what steps, and all our people, because Africa's development cannot be only the business of governments. It has to be the business of its citizens as well. And so we'd like to use this year, this celebration, to energize, to galvanize our people to be part of this vision, which we call Africa 2063, which will see Africa prosperous and at peace with itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Madam Suma. I, I would like to use this opportunity just to highlight uh, that we are here uh, assembled not only to discuss those issues, but to make real progress. And in this context, I would like to thank you for the great partnership uh, we just ended uh, the special meeting on the Pro-Africa initiative. We had very concrete discussions on infrastructure. Um, thank you for um, uh, letting the World Economic Forum uh, be your partner in, in, in those initiatives. Now, Mr. President, what, what is your outlook? Um, what is your dream for Africa in the next 50 years? <laughs> when, we, when we will be again on the stage, because we are so committed in 50 years, what would you be <laughs> particularly proud of? Well, I think uh, the, the, the chair of the <coughs> AU Commission has really highlighted what we want to be, what we want to be as a continent, <coughs> given, I think, the potential and also the the kind of the understanding that the, the Africans themselves have today and the commitment <clears throat> to move forward. In 50 years, we would like to see Africa, as it, she has been describing it, the Africa that will be connected totally, the Africa that will be economically very viable, the Africa that will be at peace with itself where there will be no single area of conflict, the Africa with a population that will be empowered with education, that therefore will be playing a role to ensure that Africa moves on all the time. Uh, we would want to see Africa that is able, at the 50th uh, time, that is able to utilize its own resources to develop itself and to trade with the world at the equal level. Uh, I think it is very possible. Because if you take the 50 years since it was established to where we are today, we are almost at a point of launching Africa into very great activities to achieve the, pro the prosperous continent. So we would like to see Africa, we should be self-sufficient in everything. And that is a possibility. Uh, you know, the, the chair was talking about <clears throat> the modern um, transport, for an example. I think we should, 50 years time, we should have a situation that not just by plane, on the ground, that in few hours we should be in every capital that we wanted to be. So that's Africa we're working for, and I think the potential is huge. The possibility is there, and the commitment. That's part of the reason we are working very hard to ensure that 
we read the African continent of the conflicts that you have, because you cannot develop Africa to what we want it to be or we wish it to be in 50 years if there are pockets of problems and conflict. That's why we are putting more effort on those kind of issues. That is why our interaction with our friends and partners and the call for support to address those issues are an important one. Because as long as we have conflict, development and conflict do not go together. So I've got it to stop and get rid of conflict in order for us to have the kind of Africa we would want to have in 50 years' time. Dr. Kavaruka, you, you made a very interesting distinction in your uh, comments. Uh, so distinction between welfare capitalism, uh, state capitalism, and uh, laissez-faire capitalism. Um, what do you see as the light motif, if I may say so, for Africa in its development? Now, Klaus, you, you put me in a fix because uh, I began by saying there's no mode of development. For a long time, we thought there was a mode one could go in the peak of the shelf. It doesn't work like that. So Chinese have found what works for them. So did the Indians, the Koreans, the Scandinavians, and others. I'm only saying that we Africans, from our own experience, learning by doing, we can go a step further. I cannot suggest here that we shall follow any particular model. But that is a mistake we have made in the past, uh, trying to copy uh, things which happens elsewhere. So I think that it will happen the way it has happened in other places. There'll be a mixture of all those models. Clearly, some degree of uh, social protection is needed. Uh, we don't want world West capitalism where there's no social protection. But on the other hand, market forces have to be allowed to flourish. Market forces will not flourish if the state is not doing what it should do. So I think it will be a combination of all those things together. This is what will get us where our leaders are saying, I think, for me, the next 50 years should at least try to banish what has been Africa's uh, fact undermining our pride, dependency on foreign aid. It cannot be that in the next 50 years we're still financing our development based on other people's taxation. We have to figure out, we have to figure out, we have to figure out how to use the extensive resources of this continent for its own transformation. And that cannot happen if we are balkanized as we are. This is why I agree with Madam Zuma and Mr. President there that we have to come together, we have to build the infrastructure, use our resources more optimally. Look, yesterday we were discussing in a panel how it is so difficult for Africans to move inside Africa. You go to Europe with your Schengen visa, you go from country to country. But here, even me, president of the African Development Bank, to go to some countries, I need a visa. I have to go around, but I'm going there to help with development. So let us allow our own talents to flourish. Let us use our own resources. Let us ensure that we unlock the potential of this continent. That is what we give pride to our children and grandchildren to ensure that Africa in the next 50 years is playing its part in trade and investment like other parts of the world. Look, 30 years ago, China was a very poor country. I was a graduate student, so it's in our lifetime. 20 years ago, India was a very poor country. All of us, some of us were still uh, maybe already in our mid-careers. I think that we can transform this continent within one generation if the things Madam Zuma was saying, Madam, Mr. President, uh, do happen. It is possible. I would argue that what we need is uh, inclusive capitalism, where everybody becomes, and I think that came out of the statements very well, where everybody is engaged and becomes in some way an entrepreneur, having the capabilities to contribute to the welfare of uh, society. 